Hello. Hi, are you on? Uh, I, the time is up. I think we can start the session now. Okay. Okay, give me a moment. I will start this with the introduction. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to GRC Educators webinar on how to make design part of your product development TNA. My name is Priyanka and I will be the host for today's webinar. Before we start the presentation, we have few instructions to all the attendees. All attendees will be placed on mute during the webinar to avoid disturbance. If you get disconnected from the webinar, please follow the same procedure to join back. 10 minutes will be allotted for the Q&A session. Towards the end of the webinar, you can type your questions in the Q&A box. This webinar will be presented by Tom Kramer. Tom has been involved in product development and design work for 25 plus years. His work experience as a design designer spans from roller coaster cars at University Universal Studio to robotic devices for cardiac surgery. Tom loves the product development and design process and is a sought after speaker on the topic of innovation. He holds an industrial design degree from MCAD along with an executive certificate in product development from Northwestern U University and a graduate certificate in biodesign from Stanford University. With that quick introduction, let's start today's presentation. Tom? Thank you very much, Priyanka. Um, I'm assuming uh, you can hear the volume is okay. If not, let, um, let me know. Um, so we'll get started here. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, this is a, a topic that I'm very passionate about and, and actually Bianca mentioned uh, over 25 years and this is actually my 30th year right now um, doing product design and development. So uh, incorporating design and design thinking into how we go about developing products is, is extremely um, important to, and the topic today. So like Bianca said, we will, um, we will go through some of this. Please um, uh, put your questions, uh, send them to her in the Q&A and we'll address those in the last 10 minutes. So we have an hour and I'll go through about 45 or 50 minutes of, of the material and then we'll go into question and answer. So the topic here is a little bit different. Um, oh, and that's me, um, uh, President and CEO of Kablooey Design. And my experience in this field, like I said, spans 30 years. And it's 30 years of doing these kinds of things on here. So it, in terms of developing new innovations, new products, new devices, um, some of the big things that I've done over that 30 year career is, is research, invention, ideation, which is you know idea development, um, design, <coughs> human-centered design and usability, engineering and prototyping um, for production. So these are all parts of the process. And the question today is, is how do we make sure design and design thinking is infused in there? So this is, this is what we're gonna go through here in the next 45 minutes. I'm, I'm gonna ask a question and, and explore three possible answers to that question. Um, and then that's gonna lead into three pathways that we can use to collaborate. And the collaborate is in today's session is focused on a collaboration that brings design and design thinking into all the steps in the development process for a new product launch, okay? And then the last thing is I'm gonna offer at the end is three keys to doing a design-driven development um, process. So this, this presentation today might be a little different than what many of you are used to. It's not so much a textbook presentation where we're going through facts in a textbook, but this is gonna be learnings over 30 years of experience about how to make product development work and succeed at um, infusing good design thinking into the process. So bear with me and uh, feel free to um, jot down your questions. So the question that I wanna ask at first to sort of launch this out is, is why do designers and engineers clash? If you've been involved in product development, you've probably seen over the years that there's this, there's this push and pull between a design group and an engineering group um, where there might be different goals in there and they're, they're clashing with each other for um, control on how a new product should be developed um, and engineered. And there's several reasons why this happens. 
Um, I think the first one is through training. Believe it or not, we actually train engineers not to be creative. At least I know that this is um, this has been very true here in the U.S. Um, over the last several decades. Um, we don't think we're doing it, but we're training them to not to be creative. There's a gentleman by the name of Sir Ken Robinson who gave a very interesting talk on education and how we educate people when we bring them um, up from childhood into their college years and in adulthood. And one of the things they, they learned in a study that he points out is that he says research has shown that young people lose their ability to think in what he called divergent or nonlinear ways, which is a key component to creativity. So when we think about product development and we're always trying to innovate in the product development, that innovation takes creativity. And this divergent nonlinear thinking is a key to that creativity. And as our children get educated and we become adults, we see that they lose their ability to do this. And here's an example from a study they did. This was a 24 year long study. And they asked a five year old child, a kindergartner to draw a bird. And this is what one of the kids in the study drew when they just gave the instructions, draw a bird. And then later throughout the course of that week during the study, um, they were doing exercises with those five-year-old children. And this is an example of exercises for math. And this is a subtraction problem where you show a workbook and an image and you say, you know, we've got seven, you know, we've got seven birds here. Now, if I draw a box around six of those birds, how many birds are left, of course, and, the, and you're teaching subtraction. So they went through these exercises throughout the course of the week. And at the end of the week, they asked those children the same exact uh, task. They said, could now draw a bird. And that same student that drew that bird at top, this is what he drew at the end of that study. You can see how his thinking was influenced by what he had learned that week and what had, he had been presented with um, in school during that week. So it's, it's not to say that we shouldn't teach um, subtraction, we should, but this kind of thinking that they showed, it's after we educate them, but what we, happens is we educate people linearly, linear thinking. But see, creative thinking, it's not a linear process in your brain. It's not linear thinking. And I think that when we try to find the most and the best solutions to a problem in our product development process, I like to call that scattered chaos thinking. So it's very, you know, the creativity part does not come from, from linear thinking. It comes from more of a scattered thinking. So at the end of that study, or at the beginning of the study, um, at the age of four years old, they tested these participants and four-year-old children, 98% of them were able to show that they could do divergent thinking, non-linear thinking. As the study progressed at the age of nine, these children, only 32% of them could show that they could demonstrate divergent thinking. At the age of 14, only 10% of them could do divergent nonlinear thinking. And at the age of 25, after they've graduated with a bachelor's degree, only 2% of those very same children, not different ones, but the same exact children who are now adults, only 2% could do divergent nonlinear thinking. So the creativity portion had been, had been you know, sort of stamped out or straightened out of their brains. I love Pablo Picasso's quote. He said, every child's an artist. The problem is how to remain an artist once we grow up. And we see that's very true in our training process. So, you know, education is one reason why this engineering thinking, and this, which is linear, and this design thinking, which is very scattered and nonlinear, they clash how we're educated. But the second reason why designers and engineers clash, clash is misinformation. Um, we don't realize that we can use both halves of our brain. Most of us have been trained to believe that um, we have a left, our left side of our brain, and, and if we're a very sort of math-oriented scientific thinker, then we are a left brain person, we have a stronger left hemisphere to our brain. And conversely, if we are a creative artist, then we have a stronger right hemisphere to our brain. But that's not actually how our brains work. Um, some studies were done at the University of Michigan and some of the things they discovered is that people do not tend to have a stronger left or right-sided uh, brain neural network. It happens more connection by connection, meaning the task you put in front of your brain is what exercises your brain to complete the task. And they further discovered that personality types have nothing to do with one hemisphere being more active, stronger, or connected. So even though you seem to have a very 
you know, straightforward personality or if you had a very odd creative personality, it didn't mean that one side of your brain was stronger or more, more capable than the other. In other words, both sides of your brain are very capable um, in every person. So the philosophy behind that is anybody can be a creative thinker, no matter how much your parents told me, told you that you are a math person or no matter how much they told you you're an art person, you have the ability, both, both sides of your brain, both halves of your brain are linked together by this thing in the middle called the corpus callosum. And you can use both sides of your brain and you need to. So sometimes we're trained not to think that through misinformation, um, but both sides of our brain are strong and usable. And then the third reason why there's this clash between two ways of thinking during development is pigeonholing. And by pigeonholing, I mean, when we give people job descriptions, oftentimes we don't give them big enough job descriptions where they care enough about the goals of other people involved in the product development process. Um, their job descriptions are very tiny. So then their view of what's important in a project becomes very, very tiny. And uh, you, you know, in order to work together from a design and engineering side and have them work together holistically and work together well, we have to understand the goals and things that are important in each of those areas and then incorporate them in. I like to think of it like a blend, like everybody who is in the product development process, whether you're a design engineer or um, a different type of engineer or a different type of designer, or if you're on the marketing side of things or the research side of things, wherever, wherever you come from, if you are in this product development process, we, we like to think that everybody should be a little bit like Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci, these are two of his works that you see right here. And the one on the left is a painting that, uh, you know, one of many, many paintings that he's done. And you can just see the beautiful, beautiful artistic quality um, that he was capable of doing in his artwork. The image on the right is from his um, sketch pad. Um, and you can see the mechanical engineering thinking that he was capable of too. So here we have one man who has the ability to be an artist and an engineer at the same time. And that's because he understood that he could use both sides of his brain. See, engineering, when we think about the engineering aspect of things, what engineering really is, engineering is really figuring things out. You know, there's many different kinds of engineers. And if someone has engineer in their title, it's because they're responsible for figuring something out. Um, and that's what the core of engineering is. And if we think about, you know, what's happening when we're, when we're working this way, when we're operating, there's a lobe inside of the brain that I like to call the figuring things out lobe. Um, that's my name for it. There's, there's, there's really a lobe over there with a much longer name than that. Um, but it's where some of this thinking occurs when you're doing creative problem solving. There's a lobe in your brain that's activated when you're doing creative problem solving. And that lobe is the same lobe that's responsible for creative activities. In other words, when you do something artistic, um, when you do something creative, like drawing, painting, poetry, you're exercising that same lobe in your brain that, that you use when you're creative problem solving. And if you think about it, engineering things and figuring things out is solving creative problems. You're, you, when you are in product development, you are tasked to be a creative problem solver. That's really your job. That's who you are as a creative problem solver. It's a creative activity. Yet when our engineers go to school and we teach it to them, we ask them to learn it, we ask them to learn it by giving them um, linear tools. And I just wanted to point that out. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna back up here. We give them logical tools. So we ask them to solve this problem by logic. We give them science, we give them math, we give them engineering, but we're not fostering that, that right side of their brain that the creative problem solving lobe is on. So through education, we've engineered out exercising the part of the brain that's responsible for creative problem solving by focusing only on math, technology, and engineering and not on these other more ethereal things. So if we think about problem solving, I like to use Socrates as another great example. Socrates uh, is the one that we look to for most of our philosophy. And Socrates broke, we break philosophy down into three major categories. If you studied philosophy in college, 
um, you, you would have studied four things. You would have studied metaphysics, which is the study of reality, uh, theories of reality. You would have studied epistemology, which covers theories of knowledge. You would have also studied axiology, which is the study of art and beauty. And you would have studied logic, which is the study of reasoning and how we reason. But if you were going to school to be an engineer in this day and age today at our local state university here, the University of Minnesota, if you take an engineering course, you are not gonna get this. Axiology, you would not be exercising, you would not be trained to exercise that right side of your brain where the lobe that is responsible for creative thinking exists. So by the way we educate you, we have engineered out the ability to foster your creative thinking. And that's common in the world today, very, very common in the academic world to see that. So I like to say, you know, we need both. You know, we need our Leonardo da Vinci's, we need people, we need designers and engineers working together as one, that right side of the brain, that left side of the brain, working together in each person. And we need people who are working in a field that's focused on the right brain and other people who are working in a field that's focused on the left brain, we need those people in those fields to be working together as well. But the strongest person has both of those working together in their own head. So I like to think of it this way. Engineers solve a problem. Remember we talked about engineers figure out how to make things work. So engineers solve a problem, creative problem solving, but designers figure out how to make it useful for humans. When you think about that, solving a problem is figuring out how to make something work, but why would you figure out how to make something work if it was not useful for the person that you are designing it for? It would be a colossal waste of time. This is why design and engineering have to be tied together from the beginning of the product development process all the way to the end. You can't focus on one and then just introduce a few tasks and activities from the other discipline in the process. They have to go hand in hand constant work from beginning to end, from the, the creation and research of the idea to getting it ready to go into production. All right, an interesting statistic um, that I've seen out there, and this came from the University Northwestern University, is that 90% of all new product development efforts fail. And it's a, it's a shocking and, and disturbing um, uh, number. Um, but if we do things right, uh, we can change that. We can improve that. So I want to share three pathways that we can use to collaborate and to join this engineering thinking and this left brain thinking with design thinking and this right brain thinking. Join them together. So physically, how, we, how can we do this? Because people sit there and think, okay, well, at my company, you know, we don't join things like that. What can we do? What should, what should we do at my company to help this? So let's, let's look at three possibilities here. Um, the first possibility is exercising the part of the brain that's responsible for creative problem solving. And I just want to, I just want to refocus on that. Um, we just talked about that briefly, but let's, let's take a look at that um, a little bit deeper here. So if we think about how we tick and how our brain ticks, um, there's a group by, called the Institute for Brain Potential, and they put out a lot of interesting data on how the brain ticks. And I've looked into some of this uh, material that they put out. And some of the things that I've learned is a healthy brain, now let's think about a healthy person. A healthy brain can laugh and a healthy, a healthy brain can understand and, and appreciate artistic things, okay? It's a healthy brain. People that have, who have a diseased brain, a weak right brain, and maybe this weak right brain in some of these patients comes from what's called agenesis of the corpus callosum. So that corpus callosum is the little piece of your brain that connects the left side of your brain, the left hemisphere with the right hemisphere. Sometimes that little connection decays, which is agenesis. And when that thing is weakened, you don't have communication between the right and the left side. So people who do not have a healthy brain, uh, that don't have this connection, they have trouble. They, they don't laugh at jokes as much. They don't appreciate or get um, the art um, they can't do it. Um, so a, high, a hypothesis around this would be, if you think about that, does environmental training, meaning lack, if, if they were trained over their lifetime to have a lack of laughter, a lack of exposure to artistic things, 
could that possibly cause weakening of the corpus callosum because they're not sending signals across both sides of the brain their whole life and they actually weaken that physiologically physiological part of the brain could it cause that weakening which would cause them um, to not have a, an act as active of a right side i don't know it's a hypothesis i'd love to do a paper on that but you remember there's a part of the brain on the right side there's a lobe over there that's responsible for creative problem solving and that is the same part of the brain that gets the joke. And it's the same part of the brain that engages in artistic activity and it's on the right side. They did a really neat experiment where they, they hooked electrodes up to people's brains to watch what part of the brain would, would uh, show electrical activity during certain actions. And they told a joke. And as you're telling a joke, as you build up the joke, um, the buildup of the joke is a linear set of events so you're explaining something, and during that linear set of events that's being described in a story, they could see a lobe on the left brain light up with electrical activity, and then they'd explain the next step, and the left side would light. And as they explain that, left side, left side, left side, lights, lights, lights up. And then when they told the punchline to the joke, a punchline to a joke, if you analyze it, is really a non sequitur. It's a non-linear conclusion to all those linear things that happened in the story. And that's what makes the joke funny. So when they told the punchline, there was a pause where no part of the brain lit up, just a brief momentary pause. And then when the person laughed and got the punchline and got the joke, that lobe on the right side of their brain that's responsible for creative problem solving, that lit up. So you can see they solved a problem creatively by connecting an unconnected thing in the story that they were hearing to the steps of the story that were connecting. And that's what made the joke funny. And isn't that the same thing that we're doing when we're trying to creatively solve a problem, when we're developing some new product, some new device, and we're doing product development and we're going through the product development process and we're trying to introduce innovation. And it isn't that what we're trying to do is connect things that might not otherwise be connected in a way that they may make sense when we don't see that from the get-go. That's that right side of your brain, that lobe on the right side of your brain. So the hypothesis might be, well, what if we stimulate these jokes, stimulate the artistic side on the right side, then will creative problem-solving abilities increase? I would like to think so. I think most of the people that I've known over the years that have worked here at Kablooey over 30 years that have been the best creative problem-solvers were also the most humorous, and artistically appreciative people that I've known. Um, so those things tend to go hand in hand. Now, so what do we do about this? And, and, and how, can we, how can we do some things about it? Well, we know in psychology that psychologists use humor to do what we call systematic desensitization to bad things. So let's say someone has a phobia, that's a bad thing. They use this systematic desensitization theory and they introduce humor to help them get over their phobia. So the question is, well, could we also sensitize people to good? It, when we expose them to humor, instead of desensitizing them to something bad, could we sensitize them to the use of that lobe in their right brain? Could we sensitize them to making connections where things otherwise wouldn't have looked like they should connect and that would lead to innovative solutions in product development? Um, one interesting thing about humor, when we are experiencing humor and we're laughing, our brain has an increase in something that's called a brain-derived neural factor. So this chemical in our brain, this hormone, is released at higher levels while we are laughing. So we're experiencing humor, we're getting a higher level of BDNF. BDNF, it's a protein, and it's responsible for the neuroplasticity of our brain. Now think about that for a minute. Neuroplasticity means our brain is able to change with its experiences. Remember before we were talking about your personality doesn't make one side of your brain stronger. It's the experiences you put in front of your brain. Why? Because your brain changes and grows neuroplastically um, based on those. So if you have more BDNF, it's a higher level of the protein that makes your brain more neuroplastic and more able to change and increase and grow um, to the situations you put in front of it. So those, those right brain, creative problem solving, disassociative, nonlinear thinking, divergent thinking situations, 
your brain can grow to accommodate those situations better and better. This protein is also responsible for storing information in your brain. And we know that 95% of the activity that goes on your brain, on in your brain, is habit, habitual. So you need to have, if, if your brain is going to do things automatically, you want it to be done in a way where it's grown in the right areas with uh, an, this BDNF that has been trained to understand divergent thinking. And then when we have fun with humor, a dopamine release makes us enjoy it and want to do it again. So it becomes repetitive and it becomes more of that 95% habitual activity that our brain just automatically does. So the point is, if you train yourself to be creative, you will automatically become more creative in situations naturally without, without having to try so hard in the future if you just work at it now. It's a lot like working out. Same thing as working out. So I'm saying if we increase humor and then we repeat artistic activities, we can become more creative people and become better creative problem solvers in the middle of a linear product development process. Okay, that's a lot of good stuff. This is why I like comics so much. They're art and humor mixed together. And again, my favorite saying from Picasso, we need to remain artists when we grow up, not just as children. Okay, so the second pathway, um, that's education. Second pathway is informing, informing all the team members of the big picture. So the second thing we can do other than co um, collaborate um, is inform all the team members of the big picture. Einstein said that if I had an hour to save the world, I'd spend 55 minutes defining the problem and only five minutes finding the solution. What was he saying here? He was saying that design research is an important activity. In other words, let's figure out what this product or device or system needs to be in order to satisfy the needs of the user first before we come up with a concept. Let's really understand the needs. So I define design research. Um, as every, any activity that you're in to gather data that enables you to make informed decisions about the potential design of this thing. Um, that's how I like to do it. So I like to think of human-centered design thinking goals as goals. So you, ha you have goals in your product development process. There are, they should be related to all of your product requirements, all these goals that you have. They need to be shared up front. It's not information that should be given out on a need to know basis. And I've seen, companies don't do this where they act like spies. You know, the engineering department doesn't share any of the deep research behind the, or the, or the marketing department, doesn't share any of the deep research that's behind the decisions that go into the requirements with the engineering team until later. And they're like, oh, that, you don't need to know that now. We'll, we'll tell you that later. Well, that's not true. Engineering, marketing, design, um, research, uh, production, uh, regulatory, all these groups need to understand what is the thinking that's gone on behind the goals and the requirements up front? That helps everybody be on the same page um, right from the start. And it helps us not be these secret agents, these lone rangers out there that are just doing our own thing in our own little bubble. But we share the common needs of, of every other discipline. It's so important, but yet it's so not done um, in the world today. And it just needs to, to be so much more... Um, so much more important, so much more focused on. And then the last thing that I think we can each we can do as, as product development groups out there who have a development process we're following for our new device or our new system is we can require and we should require many concepts to, eval to be evaluated before narrowing down to one. This is extremely important. And those many concepts that are being evaluated should be created and evaluated with the help of all of those disciplines, not just engineering, not just design, not just marketing, but all of those groups and corporate and research and clinical and regulatory and quality, you know, all of those groups should be giving input into these concepts. Um, so it can, before it gets narrowed down to one that we just push, because if we just have one that we push down a path, and then it needs to change. When you get a long ways down that path and you get close to production, it's very expensive to change it then. But if we're all giving input in the beginning and then we end up having a collective concept for this product or system that all these groups are agreeing on, um, the likelihood for a costly change down the road is so much more, uh, is so much smaller. I like to think of it like this. 
in, in academia, when we're in college and we're getting trained to be engineers, a lot of value is getting put on finding the right answer. Um, we're trained to find the right answer instead of exploring possibilities. So I love this little example. Um, you know, if we were just on that engineering path and in our academic training and we never did any right brain activities and we were tasked with this idea to, to draw a square, we would think like the thing on the left. You know, there's four, uh, four 90 degree right angles and that thing becomes a square. And that's what we would do. And we would fulfill the requirements, would we not? We would fill the re fulfill the requirements of drawing me a square. But would we have anything innovative? No, we would not have pushed the boundaries. But if you've been trained to exercise that lobe on the right side of your brain, if you've neuroplastically expanded that, if you've been engaged in humorous and, act and artistic activities, and if you've increased the amount of BDNF in your brain, and now your brain automatically automatically goes to nonlinear divergent thinking when a problem is presented so you can connect things that don't make sense then you might answer that question draw me a square like the picture on the left um, and would you have fulfilled the, the requirements yes you would have but would you have done it in a more innovative way certainly you know the first one is a negative space that exists with all the things around it thinking outside the box the one in the middle on the bottom that says me, draw me, the word me, as a square. So you've done that. And the third one, the little cartoon in the corner, drawing me, that's a picture of someone calling themselves me to look like a square with the U pointed at it. So very, very different thinking. And this is a very great example of having that strong right brain. So not putting so much emphasis on the right answer, but let's explore a lot of possibilities. This is what it looks like when we at Kablooey Design are exploring a lot of possibilities. This example is just a surgical device, a medical device, and they had a lot of requirements. They said, we need to do something that accomplishes this set of tasks. So the first thing we do is tons of quick, quick sketches like this. Our, our team members will sketch out a bunch of stuff and say, what about this? What about that? And everybody gets to look at it and talk about it and think about it and say, what's good about this? What's bad about it? What would work? What wouldn't work? And we can, com we can combine the best features and put them together. And the sketches don't have to be that great. Those were sketches that were done by our industrial designers. But look at what our engineers can do, too. Our engineers can sketch stuff like this. It doesn't matter if you're from design, if you're from engineering, if you're from marketing, if you're from quality. Everybody can draw like that picture on the left, the little guy pulling a square and the word pulley. So it's just getting your ideas out visually. Why is that important? If you write your ideas down as words on a list, what side of your brain are you using? You're using the left side of your brain. It's very linear. But if I ask you to solve a problem with a device concept and you draw it out in pictures, what side of your brain are you using? When you draw, you're using the right side of your brain. You're exercising that creative lobe. You're going to see it visually. You're going to think of it on the right side of your brain, and you're going to be more creative. So I encourage all people, as they're thinking through concepts, draw them, even if you can only draw as good as the person on the right. It doesn't matter. OK, so in our last few minutes, um, I wanted to cover three keys to doing design driven development. So what we've been talking about up to this point is we have to think in a design thinking way while we're doing development. So we've called that at Kablooey, we've called that design driven development, or we call it the D3 process. Doing product development with design thinking. So we've talked about how it's important for you to train yourself to do it. We've talked about some things that you can do as a team that you should incorporate into your company and your department that you should be doing as best practices so you can be doing it. Now, while you're doing design-driven development, I just want to highlight three important things to consider and to think about that will help you be effective while you're doing D3, or design-driven development. And then we can take questions after that. Okay, the first thing is create a Senate subcommittee. So I'm being a little facetious about this, um, but here in the United States, um, our, our lawmaking branch, is, our Congress, is, has two aspects to it. We have, we have a House of Representatives and we have a Senate. 
And our Senate is made up of all these senators that come from different various states with different um, agendas and different priorities. And so what they do when they want to solve a problem is they create these things called subcommittees. So they have a Senate subcommittee. And these are people from each one of these areas that can all represent and, uh, and, and solve a problem by representing the needs from their particular area. So how do we translate that to, your, to our companies where we work? Well, you've got all of these divisions again. You've got marketing, engineering, design, manufacturing, quality. Get a committee together, a group of people where you have a representative from each one of those areas and have that group be responsible for doing reviews of the product development process and the outputs from the very, very beginning all the way through. So every time a concept is generated, this committee is reviewing it. That way you get input from the entire company. Um, the second thing is more broadening and less specializing. And I guess I, I, wanna, I wanna point out one more quick thing about, about the subcommittee. Um, it's important to give everyone um, a voice, but eventually one person or one group is gonna be responsible for the official product requirements and project requirements. So there, of course, there has to be an official list of requirements. And these requirements include all kinds of things, the user requirements, uh, you know, the functional requirements, all kinds of things. So one person, and it's usually, you know, somebody from R&D, and that could be somebody from the engineering group, the design group, uh, you know, one of these other groups, but somebody is responsible. So one person in this subcommittee should be the person that is ultimately responsible for the official requirements document. And that way, uh, that person can be sharing the build, the, the development of the requirements as they're being developed with the rest of the subcommittee and everyone can have their input into it. Okay, second thing is more broadening and less specializing. So, you know, one of the things that we already talked about a little bit is in academia when you are um, getting your degrees uh, and you're being trained, uh, our academic world tends to specialize. So your training can be very, very, very specific. And you know, there's pros and cons to that. I, I mean, if you're training to be a, a doctor, you go to med school first. And then if you're gonna be a surgeon, you know, you learn some things about the surgical field. And then if you're gonna be a specific kind of surgeon, you get training just in that one specific. And it makes sense because if someone's going in for a specific gallbladder surgery, they want the person operating on them to be the utmost expert in, in gallbladders. They don't want somebody, you know, who's an expert in, in ingrown toenails, you know, obviously. So, I mean, that's, that's the important side and the good side of specialization. However, I think in our academic world, we've become too specialized at the expense of, uh, of becoming weak in area, other areas that are extremely important. So you remember my little analogy of Socrates that I shared. You know, when Socrates, and I remember I shared how um, when you study philosophy now, you would study it in those four, those four sections. That's not necessarily how Socrates taught it. When Socrates was teaching philosophy hundreds and hundreds of years ago, he wasn't teaching it like this is a philosophy class. He was teaching it like life. He was saying, this is life. This is, this is what we need to know as high functioning human beings. And it included everything. It included art, it included beauty, it included logic, it included met metaphysics. All of that was, was together. So when they taught, they were teaching things very holistically. Now, you, you, know, you, you don't get all of that, you just get specialized. So we kind of have to take it on ourselves. I mean, if you're an educator, you can try to push for a broader range of exposure to your that your students would have to different various related and important um, learning areas. And then you as a student, if you are learning, you have to take it upon yourself. No one, no one is gonna push it on you. You have to take it upon yourself to become educated in areas that are associated but distant from your, your specific core so you can be a more well-rounded person. That's why I have the picture wearing of this guy wearing several hats. 
um, we say that we have to wear a lot of hats. If you're gonna be an efficient innovator, you have to wear a lot of hats. I don't know any innovators that only wear one hat. Almost every innovator that I've seen come through our doors here in 30 years of work in the innovation industry, almost all of them were people who wore a lot of hats and had a broad understanding of a lot of related things. They weren't just specialists in one tiny little area. You just can't innovate with that narrow of a vision. So we need to broaden ourselves. Academia needs to broaden its teaching a little bit and get less, less specialization. And then the last thing that I think is important to focus on is usability is king. And, and I'm gonna drop back again one more time. Sorry, for, sorry for doing that, but I just had another important thought here about more broadening, less specializing. So how do you do this? Because this is, this is all about what are you gonna do at your company, in your department, at your office? to be effective when you go back. So this is related to members of your team, your group. Um, so what you can do is you can go back to your group and start to give you, if you're on a, a project that's developing a new product, give each other responsibilities that are outside of what you would normally focus on. So if you have people in your group that are normally just focused on one thing and they only do one thing, on this next project, don't do that. Go back and give them tasks that are in another area, that are outside of it, so they can appreciate what other team members are going through. They can contribute to what those other team members might be thinking. Now, you don't have to give them the whole responsibility, but give them a little piece of the responsibility to be helpful, to be helping in that area, um, and then let it grow and grow and grow from there. Uh, it, it, I'm telling you, you might think it's not as efficient because they're not gonna be as good as that as they are in the area that they know well and are efficient in, but, it will help you be more innovative in the long run and you just have to, you have to buckle down and just do it. Um, and it will help, you won't be sorry. You, you will not be sorry that you did it in the long run. The last thing is usability is king. So usability engineering, same thing as human factors engineering. Never, never forget to put a strong focus on this. Again, remember what we said earlier about design is making, engineering is making something work but design is making it useful for humans. That's what usability is all about. The best device in the world that is just has the greatest technology and function so perfect, if it's not usable for, for a human, nobody is going to buy it. If you go back to my medical device example where I showed those drawings of that medical device, we could have come up with the coolest technology for making that thing work, but if the physician that was using it said, I, I can't use this, it's just too cumbersome, it's too heavy, it's too big, it's too hard to operate, I'm not gonna buy it. If nobody buys it, then it's, it's all for naught. So we have to understand, we have to do the research in the beginning that answers the question for us, what does the user need to do to be successful with this device or system in the end? And if we can answer that question, with a lot of different things, um, that's what usability is all about. And then we test through usability engineering, then we test our theories by having mock prototypes that our users actually use. And we watch and see what happens and we record that data and then we make changes. We have to do that early, mid and late in the development process. And don't forget the early because people tend to skip it early and think they'll come up with a solution first and test it later. But early testing, so many people ignore early testing. But early testing is so, so, so very important to having a good usability engineering effort on your project. Okay, so those are uh, the major things um, that I had for how to make uh, design and design thinking part of your product development DNA. And it's all about having a design-driven development mentality and using that throughout your entire product development process. So um, I wanna take questions. Um, I thought I had a slide here where I reviewed um, all of the major points, but I guess I don't see that here. There might've been some sort of, some sort of mistake, but you guys will have access to this, um, to this PowerPoint presentation. So you'll be able to go back um, and, and look at all those things. But the, the, the original question was, why do design and engineering disciplines clash? 
And there were several reasons that were related to training, uh, misinformation, um, and understanding how the brain operates. Um, and then there were some things to focus on um, that would help us understand how to do our design and development better. And um, they were related around the ideas of being a nonlinear thinker, strengthening um, the right side of your brain, incorporating um, activities that involve all of your team members and left brain, right brain activities, sharing information and being cross-functional um, within your groups. And then also um, wearing a lot of hats and focusing on not specializing. So those, those were kind of the major things that we focus on today. Um, but Priyanka, we're right at that hour where we have about 12 minutes or so left. So um, if we wanna go to the Q and A, um, we can jump over um, to the questions and see if we can take um, any questions. We are now open for the Q&A. Please type your questions in the Q&A box. Okay. Thanks, Priyanka. And, and while we're waiting for questions, um, I can just continue with a, with a couple of things. Um, again, I want to thank you all for, um, for attending. And, and obviously, um, I want to thank you um, to sh by attending, by showing that it's important to you that um, design thinking is important and, and having a result at the end of your product development process that's something that the users um, can really incorporate into their life. Um, thank you for making that important. Um, in our world, so much of what we do, a lot of it is related to medical devices and that's a great example because if we're making sure if, from a medical device standpoint, if we're making sure that the user in the end, which is probably a physician of some sort or some related type person, that that person can use the device well, the reason that's so important to us is because it's saving lives and it's improving people's lives physically through their health and their well being is being affected because our innovation and our technology is being done in a way that physicians will, and hospitals will purchase it, they'll buy it, they'll use it. And if they do that, it's going to have a positive effect on the patients and the patient's lives. And that's what we really wanna do, is we wanna have a positive effect on people's lives. And if we didn't have a good design thinking and design development process in our product development, it would be so less likely. We, we would be in that 90% failure rate where nine out of every 10 things that we tried that we thought were gonna help people's lives, nine out of 10 of them would fail and would never help anybody. And that's not doing the world good the way that we want to. We would like to see that change and see nine out of 10 succeed and actually help. In Brianka, while we're waiting for questions, it is interesting that studies have been done and I have this data, I just didn't share it in this presentation. But data shows that when product companies who are doing new product development and new product introductions, when, when companies embrace the type of thinking and development that we just talked about today, when they embrace that and incorporate into their product development process, that failure rate statistic, it's almost inverted. Um, statistics show that 86% of companies that are doing this type of development and are thinking this way, 86% of them meet or exceed their timeline for launching a new product. And, and that's a, an important success statistic. If you can launch on time and get your product out there, out there in the world on time, you know, you are helping those patients and doing the world good by getting it out there. And it helps you compete because you're getting it out there ahead of your competitors. Um, similar to that statistic, so that's 86%. Um, similar, 81% of the companies that are operating like this and thinking this way, 81% of them are meeting their revenue goals on their new product launch. So that's a huge success statistic um, because you know if a company with a new product out there is meeting the revenue goals, that means they're selling it out in the world at the level that they were hoping to, which means it's getting into the hands of the users and it's helping the people that it's supposed to help and it's improving the lives 
of the people that it's supposed to help improve. So, you know, that averages out to about 83% success rate doing it this way compared to the 90% failure rate of doing it the other way. And the other way is basically coming up with, a, with an idea first saying, we think this new technology um, is the way something should be done. And then you engineer it, build it, and then you know, test it and launch it out into the world and then discover that things need to change. So that's kind of um, the non-design thinking way of doing things. And that's, that's where the, fail, the high failure rate comes in. Good, so, so Brianka, we have, we have one question um, that, that actually constantly comes to us. And um, it, it, it's someone in a, in a design group um, that is in, the, in an engineering department which is part of their R&D group. And um, this engineer is asking, and, and this, is, this is common, is, in, is, is asking, well, what type of activities would we incorporate into our daily process um, in order to do the things that you're talking about here today? And so I'll give you a couple of uh, quick examples. One is, is your brainstorming sessions. Um, if, if you don't have brainstorming sessions, um, you should, that's the first step, um, early in the process before you've got a, a concept solution. Um, you need to have brainstorming sessions first, so that's step one. If you do have them, then the next uh, step up is you need to revamp how you're doing them. And um, a good way, I think a good practice to follow for your brainstorming sessions is first, do them early. Number one, do them early before you have a concept. You, you understand what the needs are, so some research has been done. So understand what the user needs are around the concept, but don't have a concept yet. Then hold your brainstorming session. The second most important thing is, so that's when you, ha you have it. The second most important thing is who. Get that cross-functional, remember that Senate subcommittee example I gave? Get a cross-functional team with people from all the disciplines, marketing, engineering, R&D, clinical, regulatory, manufacturing, Get a representative from each of those groups together and have that be your brainstorming group, okay? And then third, use bold and different techniques for brainstorming. So most people, when they brainstorm, they get that group around the table and then they say, okay, well, here's the problem. We need a better way to do X, Y, Z. You know, our, our product does this right now, but it needs to be better. And then they sit around and come up with ideas. Um, that's better than nothing, that, that's, that's good, it's okay. But you can really, really revamp the way you do it to be much, much more creative. And I'll offer things out there, a few examples. My favorite example is reverse brainstorming. And I'll give you a, a quick reason, and, and we've only got a little bit of time, but I'll give you a quick reason why that's so fun and so important. So remember our discussion about nonlinear thinking, and remember, my example of telling a joke and how a joke is a linear piece of information, linear piece of information, linear piece of information built on top of each other, and then all of a sudden a non-linear piece of information. And your brain has to figure out a way to join those things. And that's what's creative. Okay, that's where the creativity comes in. Okay, well, when we brainstorm, if, if in a joke we know that we're activating the right side of our brain, the creative side of our brain, when we do that, why wouldn't we force our brain to do the same thing when we brainstorm? So when we reverse brainstorm, we end up doing something that makes no sense whatsoever. And then we figure out a way to make it make sense. And when you do that, you're doing the exact same thing. You are forcing that lobe on the right side of your brain that's responsible for creative problem solving. You are forcing that side of your brain to come up with a solution because the linear side of your brain won't have the solution because you're, you, you've set up an exercise that won't do that. So I'll give you an example. This is how reverse brainstorming works. Let's say you have uh, a task that you're going to brainstorm on. Let, let's, say, let's say you're you're Apple and you've got the iPhone out there. And let's say you're, you're all sitting around brainstorming this cross-functional team. And they, they say, one thing we're going to brainstorm on is how this device is held. Users complain that they drop it all the time. And we need a better grip. 
It's uncomfortable to hold. We get a lot of complaints. We're afraid our competition is gonna beat us with a better, more grippable device. Let's brainstorm on how to make this have a better grip, okay? Regular brainstorming would be, well, gee, well, you know, a, a grip on my bike handle is pretty cool. Let's make it look like a bike handle. You know, that's traditional brainstorming. You could probably come up with a few ideas that way. But reverse brainstorming says, okay, instead of making it easy to hold, let's come up with as many ways as we can to make it as difficult to hold it as possible. Let's make this phone as difficult to hold as possible. And let's say somebody comes up with the idea of let's make it a big, heavy, round, glossy sphere. If this phone was smooth and glossy and slippery and it was heavy and it was round, that would be hard to hold. You'd hold it in your hand and it would just fall out. Okay, crazy idea, nonlinear thinking, very, very stupid. But then that might get to be somebody thinking, well, what you're describing is like a bowling ball, right? And then somebody might say, well, how do people hold bowling balls? Well, they drill holes in them for your fingers. Oh, okay. Drilled holes, what are those? That's, that's like an inverted glove. A bowling ball is really a glove stuck inside of a huge sphere. That might lead you to be thinking a glove hugs your hand. It never falls off of your hand. And then you might invent the glove phone where you wear a glove and the phone is embedded in the fabric of your glove and now you have the least droppable phone on the planet, okay? Much more innovative than a phone that looks like your bicycle handle. So you see what I'm saying is your brain, the lobe in your right brain that's responsible for creative problem solving, just made a series of non-sequential, non-linear connections that would have never otherwise made had you not presented it with a problem that was not linear, that was just unconnected. So revamp the ways that you do your brainstorming with creative, creative techniques like that. There's, there's a ton of them out there. You can just look them up and Google them. Or we have a, we have a little um, booklet that we send out that has a list of my favorite brainstorming techniques and a little booklet that I'm happy to send anybody. If you go to our website, www.kablui.com, contact me and in the contact, just ask for the brainstorming booklet. I'll send it out to you free of charge. Uh, more than happy to do that. So. That's one way to look at it. Um, Brianka, we're down to just our last couple minutes. Are there, are there any other questions out there? Yes, uh, we are now open for the Q&A. Uh, we will allow uh, one minute more. If you have any questions, uh, please type it in the Q&A box. Tom, I don't see any questions for this session, so I think we can wind up the webinar. Okay. Well, I just want to thank everybody for attending. Thank you for your interest in good product design and good product development and uh, improving the lives of people in this world. Thank you for listening. Glad that I could be of help today. Thank you, Tom, for your time. It was a great presentation. Thank you all for joining us today. For more details on our upcoming webinar, please visit www.grceducators.com. Have a great day. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I hope, you. I hope your throat is feeling better. Yes, kind of. Thank yeah. you very much. Bye-bye. Okay. Have a great Bye -bye. weekend. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.